Well, by the day of the public confrontation on August 25, the nation's interest was intense. Everyone had an opinion about the case, and many of those opinions were fiercely held. And your view of the case told you told a lot about your views on other matters, and I want to digress for a few minutes on this because this case had become a major political litmus test in the country, and I'm, I'm going to do a bit of background setting and philosophizing to explain why, other than the human drama, people cared so much about this. If you can't wait to see what happened at the public hearing, uh, go on to number 13. But um, A lot of people have the impression that the Cold War began the day World War II ended, but this is not so. As late as this case, public opinion in this country was very fluid. There were many views about, differing views, about what America's role in the post-war world should be, and indeed about the nature of the post-war world itself, and about the nature of the Soviet Union, and within this country, the Communist Party. One view, which was a, which I call the traditional conservative view, especially held by Republicans from the middle of this country, held that we're right back where we always had been, an economically self-sufficient nation with big oceans to our east and west and friendly, non-threatening neighbors north and south. This is long before guided missiles and satellites. Now we have the only atom bomb. And let's go back to our pre-war isolationism. Frankly, uh, it's too bad that anywhere goes communist, but do we really care if Europe goes communist or China goes communist? Who cares about the Soviet Union? What are they going to do to us? Who needs the UN, the Marshall Plan, the International Monetary Fund, and the Communist Party is just a tiny bunch of sicko cranks. Who cares about them? A second view reached the same result. No hostility to communist countries and no worry about the domestic party, but by a totally different path. And I call this the century of the common man or one world view. It held that no, we're not back in the good old days of the 1930s. The whole world has changed as a result of the Depression and the war, and we are on the verge of a new age of reason, virtue, and justice in the world. The Great Depression completely discredited capitalism, private property, making money. The two world wars had completely discredited the nation state, look what it leads to, and traditional religion, which tolerated all this slaughter. All the old institutions of the world were discredited, and to take their place would arise the common man. Indeed, the century of the common man was dawning all over the world, and ordinary people everywhere would ignore artificial differences of birth and race and nationality and would form a common bond and help each other and share and share alike, just like at the UN. And many people who held this view believed that there was one place in the world in which concrete steps towards the establishment of such a regime of justice and virtue had occurred, and that was in the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. And it was the error, and in my own opinion, the shame of these people, that this view was held most strongly during the very years that uh, the Soviet people were suffering the worst tortures of Stalin's communist rule, and he was killing them off by the millions. Um, the people who held this view were a good many on the left, and many practicing Christians. Uh, they took umbrage at any statement that was critical of communism or any policy of opposition to the Soviet Union. Um, they said, okay, they're a little rough around the edges, but at the end of the day, they're still family. They're still on the side of the people. And needless to say, this side rallied to the defense of Alger Hiss, seeing in him the model civil servant, the enlightened liberal statesman and cool man of reason, being assaulted by the savage mob of HUAC, especially Richard Nixon in his off-the-rack suits. This, band, this side's mindset is well represented by a man you may have never heard of, but I think some of his quotes are too good to pass up. I'm speaking of a man named Harold Lasky, who was a lecturer at Harvard and Yale, a writer for the New Republic magazine, the chairman of Britain's Labor Party, half author of a famous correspondence with Mr. Justice Holmes, and for 25 years a professor at the London School of Economics. He wrote a book towards the end of World War II called Faith, Reason, and Civilization, and in it he makes clear that the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin is his model for the future of the world and is an exemplar of Christian values. And he writes, It's difficult to see upon what basis the civilized tradition can be rebuilt, save that upon which the Russian Revolution is founded. When the last word has been said against Russian bureaucracy, against the hindrances to political self-expression we know in Britain and the United States, against the scale on which the terror has been conducted, against the ugly Byzantinism of its party infallibility, 
the solemn truth remains that in the Soviet Union, since the October Revolution, more men and women have had more opportunity for self-fulfillment than anywhere else in the world. From the Russian Revolution, the principles that seem to emerge are the same as those which underlie the dream of the early Christians, and so on. At the risk of beating a dead horse, I'll add one more comment by an American politician named Henry Wallace, who was vice president under Roosevelt, his third term, said, I would say that the communists are the closest things to the early Christian martyrs we have today. Now, I want to emphasize that these statements were not written by fringe characters or nutcases, but by highly intelligent and humane men who wanted peace and abundance for all. Lasky was a leading British intellectual, greatly admired by liberals. Henry Wallace was vice president of the United States. And about communism, I'm sorry to say they were both idiots. Um, please note several factors about this mindset. The assumption that capitalism and individualism are over, a very gauzy view of the Soviet Union, the tremendous optimism about the world, and fourth, the terrible failure to see that what their, their hope and their sentiment and their letting their dreams get in the way of the facts um, made them embrace what was, in fact, the enemy of all liberal values. But this was the world of a lot of leftist intellectuals as late as 1948. Now, the third view that was abroad in the land I'll call the triumphant capitalist view. Um, it was optimistic, like the common man, but that's about the only thing they had in common. It held, look, Europe has committed suicide in two world wars. Russia is locked in poverty because of the war and communism. China's in good hands. Chiang Kai-shek's in charge there, and he's our guy. The rest of the world is a colony. The United States, on the other hand, has emerged from the war, not physically damaged. We're out of the Great Depression, full employment, the only bomb. We've figured out the way to live. Liberal capitalism with a safety net and a lot of political freedom. And the next century is going to belong to America. It's going to be the American century. In fact, Chambers' boss, Henry Luce, wrote a famous essay of that title, The American Century in Life magazine in February 1941. And this view says America has to be involved in the rest of the world. We have to lead the rest of the world in an optimistic, triumphal, expansionist way. We have no enemies anywhere nothing but good times ahead. And finally, there was a small group of mostly middle-class people, generally suspicious of the rest of the world, who said, who were not optimistic, and who said, no, we cannot return to the old isolationism, and we can't be optimistic. This new world, that's, there is a new world being born. It's very scary. Communism is on the march everywhere. They've taken over Russia. They've taken over Eastern Europe. Looks like they're taken over China. They may be hiding under our beds and in the woodwork. And this last group found its footing in the Hiss case. The communists are not only in the march in all those foreign countries, they're here. They were here in the Roosevelt Truman administration. And they hated Hiss as the arch representative of Eastern money and good breeding, forgetting for a moment that he didn't come from a rich family or a high society family. But he, he certainly looked like it in his postgraduate edu education at Harvard and cultural sophistication multinational organizations, the whole lot. These people, by the way, didn't necessarily like Chambers because he was in some ways even more cosmopolitan than Hiss. And a lot of these people were anti-Semites and Chambers' wife's maiden name was Esther Shemitz. But in the Hiss case, this fourth group found its dream becoming reality and they could say to the traditional isolationists and the triumphant capitalists, no, the world is not as simple as you think. There are enemies who seek our destruction, just like the Nazis, and some of these enemies are among us, and we have to act to root them out, or there'll be no future for normalcy or triumphant capitalism or anything good. Now, aside from the, these ideological divisions I've just mentioned, um, the his case caused some fascinating social divisions in this country, based on class and style. If you'd been born on the right side of the tracks and you went to an Ivy League university and you shopped at Brooks Brothers and read The New Yorker and knew how to order a bottle of wine in a French restaurant, even if you were a conservative Republican, you tended to take Hiss's side. He represented, as Alastair Cook wrote, the good breeding, graceful probity, plain living, and high thinking of the New England tradition of service to the nation. But if, you tended, but if you'd had a hard life and you went to a college that no one had ever heard of, et cetera, et cetera, in other words, if you were Nixon, uh, 
you thought of yourself on the outside looking in, not as one of the beautiful people. You tended to despise Hiss and to side with Chambers, regardless of your politics. Now, there was another group that tended to lead towards Chambers, uh, lean, lean towards Chambers that you might not expect. And these were intellectuals who were liberals, leftists, even intellectual Marxists in 1948, but who had been in the Communist Party back in the 30s. And one of these people, James Wexler, who was a very liberal editor of the New York Post, said, if you'd, and this isn't a direct quote, if you'd been in the party in the 30s, you'd seen a few people who were just as well put together as Alger Hiss, and there was nothing implausible in the story Chambers was telling. In fact, it had a dreadful ring of truth to it. And he said, and now I am quoting, they knew that there had been a darker side to the Communist Party, and in their time, in or near the party, had seen people who were just as well put together as Alger Hiss. Their own infatuations with the party had mostly been brief, and many of them had emerged still leftists but implacable enemies of the party. But we could imagine the rationalizations that would lead someone to do what Chambers said Hiss did. And he said, for all of us, this whole case was a reminder of our rumbustious youth that we would just as soon have been spared. And we were genuinely puzzled by Hiss's total denial and said, we thought to ourselves, if all of these he's being accused of as having been in some silly chat group in the depths of the Great Depression, why doesn't he just come out and say it? Well, the eyes of all these groups were on the congressional hearing room on August 25. It's one of the first congressional hearings that was broadcast on television. And that is where we go next. <laughs>